broadcasting worldwide from a studio inside global headquarters of RP Enterprises in Kansas City. In Kansas City. Hey gang! Ladies and gentlemen, Papa's home! This is the Papa Ron Podcast. File transfer in progress. With Ronnie Phillips and Jillian Gray. Showtime. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Papa Ron Podcast, episode 45. Excited to have you here, and we're excited about today's guest, who's somebody we've been trying to get on for probably, oh, I don't know, a year. It seems I like mean, it's been a year. I feel like it was hot outside the first time I talked to yeah, Paul. Yeah, and it's not oh. out like it's going to be 70-something yeah, today. It's so it's been a while. warm for, for yeah. March. Anyway, before we get started with Paul... I want to again remind you about this brand new blend of coffee that we released a few months ago called Gratitude and Empathy. It's a partnership with our friends over at Gertie.coffee.com. It's just as much about the mission as it is about the coffee. If you start your day with coffee, why not start it with the right mindset? Gratitude and Empathy. It's kind of like a two-in-one package. You get coffee and you get the mindset all in one. Right, right, right. What other coffee's doing that for you? So check it out (laughs) over at Dirty.coffee.com. Use promo code PAPA. That's P A. PA, again, promo code PAPA, you will save not only on the gratitude and empathy, but any of the products that they have. And that's wonderful coffee, by the way. This isn't your run of the mill. Yep. Big box store coffee. Good stuff. This is a very, very good coffee that is made at a roastery um, somewhere in Texas, I believe. Hmm. Anyway, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's a smooth Brazilian medium roast with the taste of nostalgia. And again, this helps support our cause here at the Papa Ron podcast, uh, that funding going back into the things that we need to do to keep this self-sufficient. <laughs> like our, cords and stuff? Yeah. Apparently yeah. we need to get some new headphone cords <laughs> because we had some technical, mean, technical difficulties getting this thing started it's today. Fine. It's fine. Anyway, thank you for your support, and please go check it out at dirty.coffee.com. Again, promo code PAPA, P-A-P-A. Paul Fraze, who is an NFL former NFL player. He's played with the Packers and the Jets and the Jaguars. Did I, did I, is that right? The, the Jaguars, and I finished off with Baltimore. Oh, my gosh. Oh, and wow. Which of those okay. four cities did you enjoy the most? Oh, every, everybody asks. The, the Jets, seven years. We were terrible, but the fans were awesome every single year. They were, you know, they were always very hopeful. Um, Then I went to, came down here to Jacksonville two years with Tom Coughlin. He he took probably five years off of my life, but we did make it to the AFC championship our second year. And then I guess shipped to uh, Green Bay and got to play with, uh, behind Reggie White. I backed him up. And oh, wow. Gilbert Brown, the Grave Digger, and all those guys. So, <laughs> <clears throat> Well, I am a sports geek, so we're going to get into all of that. First of all, I'd like to remind everybody who's watching, we don't typically do, I think this might be the third or fourth virtual podcast that we've done. So this all looks a little bit different than a typical Papa Ron podcast. You can view this on YouTube and Spotify, so feel free to check that out. Um, I should probably also start by saying that this uh, interview kind of came together through my cousin, Shari. So Shari has been uh, a close relative, obviously, for years. And she's also in the in the headspace of not only her faith, but the the personal development and mental health and the things that come with that. And and uh, naturally, a lot of the episodes that we do here at the Papa Ron podcast isn't always about mental health. But, you know, because of what I experience, it's something that we lean on and we want to use this as a platform to give people hope and know that they're not alone. And um, Shari had listened to a few of these episodes and said, man, I've got a guy that you need to talk to. My good friend, Paul, he used to play in the NFL and he works in the mental health space. He's an author and he travels across the country doing seminars and public speaking. And so I guess let's start with your story. I mean, we will get into sports and and I want to get into the depths of that and talking about players and the relationships with former players and coaches and things like that. But um, let's get started with why you're such a big advocate in the mental health space. Oh, wow. Gosh. Well, uh, so I definitely got introduced to uh, tragic circumstances, right? right? And 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 mental health usually is wrapped around some type of tragedy uh, or, and uh, basically when um, we, we had a son, Joshua, uh, who was afflicted with a very, very, um, uh, uh, just a disability. I mean, it, it, it's a death sentence. He was afflicted with myotubular myopathy, and uh, only 50% of these kids make it to their 18th birth or 18th month, uh, not birthday, their 18th month. Wow. Um, so definitely turmoil and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, but also 
uh, I've been involved with uh, ele- clinical trials for CTE and uh, concussions and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot about it and went up to Boston University with uh, with uh, their group up six, seven, eight years ago, uh, started uh, with that. And um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that are intertwined with mental health when you uh, bump your head, uh, you know, 10,000 times. Right. Mm. Uh, so um, and I was concerned about modalities. I want to find what will help in, in, in this space, in the mental, mental health space, into the concussion or TBI or CTE space, anything like that. And, and I've, I've run into a, a few people that... Uh, one group uh, stopped suicide. I actually am uh, a board member on their group, and it's some from Bethlehem, uh, Mississippi. And I- I've learned about suicide, and uh, uh, and uh, it's just there's there's things that are it seem to be overtaking our youth and our society as a whole. So it's it's time to be um, and get rid of the stigma hmm. and be able to just talk be able to voice your stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> and and that's that, that that's the first step into right recovery mm-hmm. so and i i believe there are modalities that uh, that we can put to use and and, uh, and they don't always inv- involve a pharmaceutical drug mm. so right so I think um, I think it was before we started recording you just in our kind of chatting while we were getting set up and figuring things out mm-hmm. um you mentioned something about being in construction. So mm. when did, is that current or is that's, that's current? That's current. Uh, I, I started uh, when I was uh, my fr- home from college and my father uh, made me uh, nail some floorboards on to the, the house that he was building mm-hmm. and it worked right in. After I, I played 11 years in the NFL and when I got out, I got into real estate and then I started uh, actually getting into building. Okay. And um, after a, uh, about an eight year hiatus i got back into it about two and a half three years ago so we're, we're building a uh, custom homes down here um actually the front long story short uh i was never going to get into it again mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden uh uh look above he's got five oceanfront houses for me to renovate or to build and i'm mm. like Okay, am I supposed to be doing this? So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm back so, in it. Right? No <laughs> so I'm back back in it. Yeah. So. Well, it sounds like you're pulled in a lot of different directions with a huge passion in this mental health space. I know you're getting ready to do a tour. I think Shari said, "Is that correct?" We've uh, I, I've been so we wrote a story about Joshua, and it's a story about hope, love, and inspiration. It's called Game Changer. It's a, a boy and do- a dog and a cure. And we've been um, doing some book signings up in New Hampshire and uh, where I grew up. Um, and we were we are absolutely uh, getting ready. Shari is is my digital guru and we are getting some uh, dates lined up. Uh, I've got some dates uh, in uh, back uh, May 23rd. We're actually doing a, um, a mental health awareness, a night of inspiration in Long Island, New York. Hmm. And uh, that that is going to expand uh, nationally. We have a huge so. following up there, so I'm glad we were able to get that. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're about to. We're about to. Yeah, well, yeah. hopefully that you know once we get out, we get this recorded, and we put out yeah. some little short clips, then you can share that, and it will get the you know help. It'll be content that we can get out there that will promote it. Um, Absolutely. Are you going to be touring anywhere else outside of the Northeast region of the states? Uh, we definitely will, but right now we're just uh, actually the the uh, the, the event on May 23rd up there in New York is kind of a pilot program. And we actually already have people in Florida that want us to come implement. Uh, it, it's a, it's a curriculum curriculum for the schools for uh, dr- drug awareness and mental health awareness. Hmm. And it's uh, it was designed by, to be accepted by New York state uh, policy and the schools, the school system. So um, we're actually being asked to start, start these, uh, these, uh, you know, nationally to, to have these events. So well, definitely let us know when you're coming through the Midwest, we'd love to help support it in any way that we can. That's, that would be incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. So Joshua is your son, right? Yes. Okay. And what, where is, 
did he make it? I don't know if I missed this part when you were explaining it because I was trying to evaluate what we were doing technically here. But did you? <laughs> is he? Did he make I'll, it past eighteen months, or is he good? Or like, where are we at here? He he did, but uh, really quick. The, the ninety second when he was born, he was one of fifty five known cases in the world. Okay, mm. ninety five. He was born in ninety five. Um, I was playing for the Jets, and Allison, his mom, was brought up in New York. And I call it New York chutzpah. Never take no for an answer. Basically, the doctor said, if he is, if your son is alive in a year, bring him back and we will reevaluate him. Mm. Oh, my. So we knew we had to do something. Uh, have, have you ever, guys ever uh, seen the movie Lorenzo's Oil? No. I can't say I have, no. Mm -mm. Well, it's it's a must say, but okay. basically it's our story. Um what, what, what we eventually did, we, we started raising money. We raised about uh, seven million, six and a half million over 13 years. We researched it. We now know there's uh, five to 8,000 kids out there with it. Um, and uh, so Joshua unfortunately passed uh, at 40 days shy of his 16th birthday. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. So, so he was 10, 10 years. I mean, uh, um, it was 2010, a uh, Christmas Eve, 2010. So, um, really quick that, that story, uh, we were the night before Christmas Eve, Joshua and I were watching, uh, Lou Giglio and, uh, Chris <laughs> Tomlin indescribable. Yes. I don't know. If, yeah. So yes. Louis, Louis, Louis did the intermission, right. For, yeah. for the, for Chris Tomlin's. Yeah. Um, so, um, I, I'm kind of falling asleep in the, in the last five minutes and I look back and Joshua was in bed. He couldn't sit, sit up. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't he eat on his own, so on and so forth. But mm. he says, dad, did you see what God did <laughs> when Louis, Louis, Louis Giglio was saying, uh, you know, kind of joking about, you know, God up there saying, bring up another telescope and I'll blow your mind of, <laughs> about, about the universes and the billions of stars and yes. this and that. Yeah. Yes. Right? And, and, and Joshua was like, dad, did you see what God did? And um, as I look back at it now, um, we lost Joshua. We, we went to sleep that night at 147 in the morning. I ran my fingers through his hair, hair for the last time and we lost him. At about uh, 11.30 that morning, Christmas Christmas Eve. Mm. But when I look back on the uh, the Lou Giglio, his, the, the indescribable, I'm like, Joshua was enlightened. Mm. You know, I had read the, the children's Bible to him, you know, since he was three months old. And we I would sit on his bed and stuff and... Uh, and but he was enlightened at that moment. And it was like almost he was ready. Yeah. So... And now he's happy and healthy and whole and so <laughs> yeah. I mean so so to that, right? We all kind of hear, you know, near death experiences and this and that. My dad had a dream about Joshua six months after he passed. And Joshua was standing on the beach, <laughs> broad shouldered, long brown hair, <laughs> you know, bronze skin. And I was like, okay, he must have been about 28 years old, right? They, 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 that's what they say, you know, in heaven, we're all oh. about, you know, between 28 and 32, right? Oh, nice. <laughs> I'll, I I'll get that my one hair before, back. But that's, that's, yeah, no doubt. Me, hey, I got the same problem. It's actually worse than you. I call it a solar panel for a love machine, though. So, um, <laughs> I digress. Anyway, uh, tell me again what the condition, what Josh's condition was called myotubular myopathy. He couldn't. Have you heard, have you heard of this? I, I mean, that sounds familiar, but I feel like, a lot of those prefixes on words we hear a yeah, lot. I hear my and so Can you kind of so. get a little bit more in depth on what that is? Right. It was one of the, uh, the, the hundreds of congenital myopathies, right? So basically it's a monogenic gene. Uh, it's X link. Mama gives it to her boys. And um, he, uh, it, it's about 35 to 40% of the striated, striated muscle cells do not form to completion. They get stuck in about the the beginning of the third trimester in, in utero. That's how, I mean, those muscle cells don't work. So most of these kids are on ventilators. Uh, I'd say 98% are on ventilators. They can't eat. They can't crawl. They don't walk. Um, very, very few kids walk. And, uh, and 
the death sentence is 50% don't make it to, to 18 months of, of life. Mm. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, that's what it is. Um, I can imagine but, that that would have been, <clears throat> and I'm, and I'm, please understand that I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. And so I don't want to sound insensitive when I ask this question, but because of the ailments or condition that he had, it had to have been, mentally physically challenging on you as caretakers which would have then been um hard on your own mental health and state of mind which is obviously where you probably got involved with this because then you had a you know an experience with depression and trying to understand and navigate through all everything that you've been challenged with can you kind of um to your level of comfort kind of speak to you know the challenge that you had ahead of you um you know, well, to, I mean, obviously, this is your son, somebody you care about. But man, oh, man, this is a tough challenge that you have to take care of him. Well, that's the, that's spot on. And uh, then so we dealt with it. First of all, you deal with things differently. Everybody deals with things differently. Even your spouse, you know, you're married this this, this person and, and you know them better than anybody. But you absolutely experience things differently. And uh, but we uh you know i was in my eighth year of the nfl ninth year and uh i i we knew that we had to have insurance i, I mean because i was of the, of the mindset you know what i've got to figure out how to keep my son alive keep my family together right and uh i i don't even care about football i just want to you know keep you know hug my son and but allison and i had some conversations and we knew we had to have insurance, mm -hmm. you know, we had to have, and, and, and I, I could still physically play. So I went out there and I played and, um, um, you know, actually it was, uh, the two years in Jacksonville and then, uh, one year in green Bay. Um, and, and the, we finished up in, 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 uh, Baltimore, but Allison didn't even come with me to green Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, when I, when Tom Coughlin decided, uh, he was better. The Jaguars were better without me. And, and he shipped me off to green Bay. Allison was like, we're not going to give, bring Joshua up to, um, up to, uh, Wisconsin for the winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He right. has respiratory issues and so on and so <laughs> forth. So yeah, mental health, mental, I was up there by myself. Um, she was down there. She was, she was, she's the one that carried the weight of the world on her shoulders. Yeah. yeah. Because Joshua was so critical that if he had a mucus plug, you had maybe 10 seconds to react and mm. respond. And I'm up in training camp in Green Bay. The first time that I really, well, well, I'm out in, in Green Bay. No, no, it was, a, it was Jacksonville. It was like a, a, um, about seven months after Joshua was born. And I get a call. Michael Hugh was our GM. And. And one of the uh, ball boys found me at 930 at night in, in the dormitory after the meetings. And they said and th th he was carrying Michael Hughes cell phone. I don't even think I had a cell phone at that time. Mm -hmm. And I get on the phone and Allison said, Joshua had a mu mucus plug. The helicopter is in the cul-de-sac and she, they're taking him down to, to, to the uh, Dallas trauma center. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I'm 12. 12, 1300 miles away, yeah. right. pacing the halls of the, of the dormitories at Stephens Point, Wisconsin, wondering if my son's going to make it. Right. Yeah. Mental yeah. health. Yeah. I, I was wavering at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's a whole part of that story in the book. Uh, I think it's chapter 24, 25. It's called the, the, the whole story. And uh, what's the name of the book? Uh, game changer game changer okay a boy a dog and a cure and it's a and it's an award-winning book we just released it about 14 months ago um we we won two nationally voted upon awards from the florida so uh, authors and publishers association a gold medal for for one category and readers favorites a, a bronze medal for another category and um i the only thing that i've be ever ever been able to you know what you, you need you need to read this book right i i'm not a salesperson i don't push it on on people but, yeah. but there's 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 not less than a five star review that anybody can find on this story and it's a story of hope 
inspiration, love. And that that goes hand in hand with some of the things that I've started getting involved with, with, with the Stop Suicide Foundation in, in, in Mississippi and uh, the Long Island Prep uh, Night of Inspiration Mental Health Matters a group up in Long Island. Um, so, and, and I know, I know I've been fragmented and I, there's so much to tell. Yeah, yeah no, that's okay. That's okay. Well, that, we've that's, been bouncing around with our questions good. as well. Well, and when you're talking, you know, I think of, I think of questions like I, um, while you were talking, I thought, okay, so do you, at, at any point there in your family, are there other children? Do you have other children? It took six years for, um, and it was mainly Allison, you know, um, she wanted that daughter. Mm. She wanted a large family. She was, she had uh, four older brothers and, uh, I had uh, three siblings and, uh, you know, her dreams and hopes were shattered, you know, mm -hmm. because again, X linked mama carries the gene. Yeah. There's a 25% chance that if it's a boy, it's going to have myotubular myopathy. And wow. this is not, you know, so this is not just this is a, a severe, severe situation. Right. Yeah. She actually went to um, some, um, what, I'm saying, I'm, I'm going to get it wrong, but some birthing specialist or, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, they actually, and she was a little older at that time. She wanted this, uh, a daughter and uh, the, the, the doctor would not take her too, too risky. Three and, and obviously in, in the in the book she describes driving away from that that appointment that morning just bawling and seeing her, her dreams um, shattered. But uh, three weeks later she was pregnant. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, with uh, and yes, Isabella. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Isabella's. 22 now gosh it's it's the the, the time wow. flies but she, it was six years six years after joshua uh had been born mm -hmm. and uh, it joshua we we've got a one of the pictures is in the uh, the book um joshua came to the hospital the day after J isabella was born and we've got a picture of him holding her just just a beautiful oh, picture oh right gosh. and he's just mesmerized he's looking at her and allison <laughs> Allison told me two weeks later, after he, you know, Isabella was home, he asked her if uh, we could send her back. <laughs> 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 but they, so, so Joshua was an honor student, National Honor Society student. I didn't even know how to make the National Honor Society, and uh, um, just a bright kid. And they had a sibling relationship just a normal brother sister fight love make up mm -hmm. this and that and just uh we we experienced a really really um wonderful uh, family situation i mean obviously no family is le leave it to beaver that's for sure right, <laughs> right. of course um, I'm trying to understand the timeline here of when all of this happens. So uh, Joshua passes away when he's 16. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And so Isabella is born when Joshua is six. Yes. Okay. So then she's, she was nine. Okay. He, 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 he passed away 40 days shy of 16. So he was 15 and whatever. Okay. okay. And, uh, and, uh, and she was, uh, nine, nine and a half all right so from the time that she was born until the time that he passed where were you at and with in your career uh i uh i only played joshua was born in 95 and i retired in 98 okay so you're talking about mental health 98 uh 99 was my last season and uh, my mental health was okay i'm gonna go home and i'm gonna do whatever i can to just sit there and take care of my family and take care of my son. And, and, uh, Oh, by the way, I'm a blue collar worker. I mean, a blue collar NFL player before mm -hmm. the, the money started going crazy. Yeah. And I have just so much and okay. Uh, I, you gotta go back to work, son. You gotta, you know, figure out how to, mm -hmm. and then we lose our insurance, mm -hmm. uh, after, after the Cobra runs out. Right. Um, 
fortunately, the NFL, uh, during Joshua's life, uh, they, they raised the cap. They used to have a million dollar cap for, you know, per family member. And uh, Gene, Gene Opshaw was still alive. You know, he was in, uh, at the players meeting in Green Bay. And I said, Gene, we're coming up against the million dollar cap. And Gene says, we're not going to leave one of our own behind. And mm -hmm. at the players' meetings, they raise it to $2 million, the, 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 that next player. So, And then they raised it to $2.5 million. Mm. And literally when we the, – the NFL at that time actually paid for one year after you left the NFL, and then you could get on Cobra. And then you can only be on Cobra for a year, and then you're off. Mm -hmm. And right at that time, interestingly, we were we were coming up against that cap. But but we would know we would only, you know, we had the access to 24 uh, seven care, mm -hmm. nursing home, nurse home health care. And we would only take 12 hours, you know, so we could get a night a night's sleep. Mm -hmm. And then we would take care of them during the day yeah. because we didn't want to burn through insurance or we didn't want yeah. to abuse the insurance. But insurance companies i think are the only entity on the planet that never lose so okay we, enough said yeah mm -hmm. so you were basically mm -hmm. in the league for just a couple more years then uh, yes. after isabella was born yes okay um <clears throat> no 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 after I joshua was born i mean after, sorry after joshua passed sorry Isabel, yeah isabella yeah. was born in 2001 so you were there for um for her to be around and i guess where i was ultimately going this is i was trying to understand how much how challenging like when you went to green bay your wife stayed in uh jacksonville she was the primary caretaker i mean you said that she was doing the heavy lifting um and then i was trying to think okay and then you're bringing another child into this and how tough that would have been but in, in this case you were home and so it wasn't i mean it's still challenging of course but not as challenging had it been if you were still playing in the league and and not around um and present um so we hear stories. I, I don't know what you know about this podcast, but we've had uh, actually you you might have played with him. I'm trying to think when were you with new? What, what was the, the time frame you were at the Jets? I was listening to Kevin Tillman's uh, thing. And at about uh, one hour and seven minutes, you mentioned the name Louis Louis Aguiar. Yeah. Yeah. Did, but did that's not who it? you're going to mention right now. That was actually. Ah! Yeah. Yeah. Did you play with Louis? I love Louis. Yeah. Mm. He. Yeah. He. Do you, do we have time for a yeah. 90 yeah. second story? For sure. We love Louis. So too. I, Louis was, he was, just, he's a kicker, right? And yeah, all kickers hunter. are a little off, yeah. but yeah, but punter, but he was the most normal punter or kicker that I've ever met. He and Pat Leahy, right? Okay. Oh yeah. Well, I ended up, our, our coach says, uh, Hey Paul, you need to start learning how to long snap. This is in training camp. So I, I start learning how to long snap oh. and I win the job. But I'm I'm a okay long snapper. The very first snap in the Meadowlands, my very first snap in the NFL. It's a, so Louis 14 and a half yards behind me, and I'm supposed to hit him on his right hip, right? Okay. And and I and I'm a blind snapper. I never looked through my legs. I was just snap and I'd block and I'd run. Yeah. And uh, um, apparently the snap landed at 12 yards three feet to his left he had to like a first baseman scoop slide it. to the left scoop it up and then he boots he blasts a 65 yarder oh wow and i didn't even know what happened and i'm uh, down in the tackle and stuff and i got come off the line and i was kind of a i was a defensive lineman long snapper which is you know kind of high strong yeah. the offensive line was just kind of like, you know they're they know no, they don't have to sprint down the, the being on the tackle. But I said, Louie, what, ha what happened? He says, no, oh, it was fine. <laughs> and my coach, and my coach comes up to me and says, Trace, what's wrong with you? I'm like, what are you talking about? He, he proceeds to tell me 12 yards, three feet to the left. Yeah. And I said, okay, Agar, I said, the reason you booted that is uh, 65 yards is because I didn't give you time to think about it. So, uh, <laughs> wow. I, I love Louie. What a, what a fantastic. Did you dude. get a chance to listen to the episode that we did with Louie? No, no. Wow. No. <clears throat> I need to, um, I'll go back to it. What, what, do you know what number it was? 
Oh, boy, not off the top I'll of my head. I'll look it up. I'll find it. it. Okay. Yeah, I'll find so, it. So um, have you talked to Louie in a while? Uh, the last time I saw him, we just st started connecting on Facebook probably about seven years ago. Uh, Dennis Bart Bird was a teammate of ours, okay. and he passed away. And they, the Jets honored Dennis. Um, he's the guy that got paralyzed in 92. We were all teammates, Louie, myself, uh, and Dennis and stuff. So um, that's I saw Louie at Dennis's funeral. Okay. So it's been, oh, time flies. I think it was six or seven years ago. It would be good for you to uh, listen. Being that yeah. you're playing in the space that you are, um, Louie came open for the first time publicly about some struggles that he had. Right. right. <clears throat> and, um, and it was very raw, very emotional. Um, he was very vulnerable and I, you know, it was, it was also a very, I don't know, special moment. It was a, it was a, it was just a honest moment. Right. And it, I done, I think it was somewhat therapeutic for him to be able to talk about some of right. those demons that he had, Absolutely. which is, you know, basically me bringing up Louie and I was eventually going to bring up Trey green and where I was ultimately going with this and we're taking a longer way to get there, but that's okay. Um, is you've got to deal with the struggles of a, a child who's got this ailment. And then we hear all the time about players who are coming out of the league and the struggle of mental health that they they have or mental illness, whatever you want to call it, because they are they've lost their now their identity mm -hmm. you know, from color, basically from high school through college and then the pros, you know, you had an 11 year career, you know, and then so all you know is football. That's all you've been living. I mean, your your income, as I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, is the, from the league. And now you've decided you're going to hang up the cleats. Well, now what are you going to do? And Louis talks about this. Trent talks about this. And he talks about how people in the league, that's one of the big concerns um, that they have as it applies to mental health because guys get out and it's just like all of a sudden they've lost their identity. They're not important anymore. They don't know what they're, what they're going to do. You know, they're now in their upper 30s or 40s and, uh, and they have no direction. And so did you have any issues with that? while trying to deal with this other dynamic that was going on in your life. Absolutely. So um, I come at it a couple of different ways, exactly how you just explained it. Life after football is not, is not easy, especially for, you know, the, the blue collar worker. And at, now these kids are getting paid so much. I, I, I want to shake them and, and make sure that they're doing the right things. Yeah. But, um, but also, um, like I said, I was involved with the, the clinical trials for C uh, chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy, and I understood. I, I learned about it. I learned about the tau protein. Why? I learned, and and I started understanding. If you if you go onto the uh, uh, a Mayo Clinic, uh, C C uh, symptoms of CTE Mayo Clinic or symptoms of CTE uh, Boston University, it's about the same list of eighteen primary issues and then another six or 10. And, and when you can check off eight to 10 at any, any given time, there's a possibility, right? Mm -hmm. That you're dealing with that. And, and the CTE, and we're talking about executive functions. We're got, talking about impulse. We're, we're talking about addiction, rage, so on and so forth, right? So all of these things kind of mirror, they're a mirror image of a mental health situation along with everything that you described your identity your you know that you know i've always said i i, I I'm, I'm paul phrase I, I i played football i'm 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 not i'm a man who played football I, i'm not a football player hmm. you know i mean but some some guys get their identity from what they did mm -hmm. from from 65,000 people yelling and screaming when you sacked dan marino Hmm. And, 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 uh, and, and I got to do that one time. And you I was like, Taurus Achilles, are you? Before his torn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if we should have blamed He's you like, for that. That's not my identity. That's not, that's not what's in me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the mental health crisis, if you, like I said, if you really dive into it and delve into it, 
my deal was so the the latest research from Boston University is 346 of 375 brains deceased NFL players brains um, had CTE. Mm. Ninety one again. Three hundred and forty six of three seventy five. Ninety one point seven percent. Oh my gosh! Now, Bob Stern, the actual one of the investigators in that study, will sell, say it's a biased sample, so you can't really because it was brains of people, family members saying, "Hey." You guys are studying CTE. My my guy, when he died, he was out, out of his mind. You need to check his brain. Mm. And so 91.7%. But what is the real number? 50%? 30%? Still a lot. <laughs> 30%? Yeah. yeah. Still a lot. And this is, this is a disease that will take you out if you don't know what you're dealing with. At 47 years old, I became apathetic. I flatlined. My emotions went nil, and I literally started going red line anger outbursts hmm. just before I got into the clinical trials. And I, I wasn't like this before. Hmm. So, and, 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 and if, if, you know, I knew I was going red line and I didn't care. You're going to listen to me the, for the for third time. If you're not, you know, my beautiful 13 year old daughter. I'm yelling at her with jugular veins popping out of my throat and this and that. Man, if I was, if it, if I was um, modeled that domestic violence was okay, that anger and that rage, I yeah. probably would have flo flown off the handle. Yeah. Fortunately, my my parents were loving parents, just normal parents that have their arguments or issues, but no, you know, no fists flying. Mm -hmm. I never touched, you know. A woman, my daughter, my, you know, mm -hmm. my, 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 uh, Allison, Joshua's mom. But I knew something was going on right at that time. I started getting involved with the clinical trials and I, and all of a sudden a light clicks on and I understand what I'm going through. Probably you can't, they still can't definitively say that you have CTE unless they cut your brain open. Ah. You die and you, they cut your brain open. They're getting closer. But the fact, it, it, but CTE is like an Alzheimer's. You can have it for 20 years before it starts showing. Wow. Right. So if the reason <clears throat> when, when I started understanding CTE and I started uh, understanding that rage outbursts and this and that go with it, I was able to start implementing some mental health strategies mm. and some, uh, I was talking to, uh, a, 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 a psychiatrist therapist. I, I, I absolutely needed to. Uh, I, I was drinking too much. Um, you, you name it. I mm -hmm. mean, we, we can, we can go another two hours about this, but get the book and read chapter 24, the whole truth. And you'll see exactly. Okay. <laughs> wow. But, but um, I lost my train of thought, but th that's, that's basically. You were basically talking about getting in with the, th or talking to a therapist on, on different mental yeah. health strategies that you could start to implement because so, of the rage and the anger that you were feeling. Exactly. So the modalities, people, we used to be told, Hey, you go out and drink, you're going to kill 10,000 brain cells and you're never going to grow brain cells back, you know, forget the dendrites, forget the oxon, but you know, so now you, you, the buzz, the buzzword for 10 years has been neuroplasticity. You mm. can grow your dendrites through meditation and, oh, really? Mm. Okay. So there's modalities. So there's hope. So if I get my anger under control and I take some things, do you, do you know it's, so there's a movie called quiet explosions. I would, I would, I have told so many people, you, you, people need to watch Quiet Explosions. There's over 2 million TBIs or head traumas in America every single year. Now, when I was asked in my clinical trials for CTE, how many concussions have you had, Paul? And I said, well, I've been knocked out probably, I think, five times. And they said, well, how many times have you seen the color purple, seen stars, had a split second of dizziness? And they listed 15 things, boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, 
what do you mean? Is that a concussion? They said, well, those are sub-concussive hits. Mm. And I said, thousands? Yeah. Every time I rammed my head into a 320-pound offensive lineman, I saw my head hurt in training camp, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but the the fact is, the the you have to so in that movie quiet explosions they really t teach you about modalities and inflammation how do how long do you think when you've got a cytokine storm of inflammatory cytokines blasting off in your head to protect from the trauma but how long do you think after the last subconcussive hit how long do you think that that um that cytokine storm or uh, the inflammation can last up to 17 years. Wow. What? That's why the tau pro tau protein is okay. It's good. It actually supports the ac the neuro the axonal part of the neurons and it keeps the microtubules uh, uh, open so acetylcholine can get to where it's supposed to go. Hmm. Right. But the tau protein, every time you hit, every time you hit, the tau protein races to races to the brain in the crevices and the cracks of the brain to heal. But if you keep hitting and keep hitting and keep hitting, just like the Alzheimer's takes 20 years of exposure to bad diet, uh, environment, so on and so forth, and the APO3 uh, genetics, genetics. If you have the genetics for Alzheimer's, you're... If, if you have one copy from mama, you're like 19% more likely to get Alzheimer's. And if you, get, if you got both copies from mama and papa, you're like 37%. But if you, you don't, if you have two copies, you don't have to get, some people don't get Alzheimer's that have two cop copies. Why? Is it their lifestyle, their uh, avoidance of, or, the, or expo not, not being exposed to? I don't. We don't know, but it definitely helps. Mm -hmm. So there's more. So, and again, I I know I'm kind of fragmented, but the the everybody was saying, hey, we 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 have to figure out how to diagnose CTE while you're alive. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't care. There, there there's a there's a pretty darn good chance that I have been developing CTE. Yeah. So give me modalities. Give me something to, you know, to fix me. Well, pharma is never going to get that magic pill. You know, mm -hmm. drugs for Alzheimer's for, have been approved and they really don't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or maybe for a little bit, but then they get, then they make the patient worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, it, and, and is that because there's so much, the, the the drugs you get approved. I'm not going to go down that route. Right. It's easy to but right. But what I'm going to what I'm going to say is, there's modalities. Omega threes. You know, omega threes, anti-inflammatory ca capabilities. Omega sixes and omega threes. Really quick. They before processed foods, in the plant life and in the foods, people ate. There there was a ratio of one to two. And omega threes is anti-inflammatory, and omega sixes is, is inflammatory. Do you know what it is after they started making processed foods and soy-based this and processed? What do you think the ratio is now? One to twenty-six. Mm. So in our diets, Alzheimer's. In our diets, mm. we're getting an astronomical imbalance of anti-inflammatory to inflammatory mm -hmm. and we've got to so omega-3s which i take supplements of every single day kind of balance it out mm -hmm. so back to the tau protein the, 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 it, you can it can stay in those areas in the brain of up to 17 years no wonder G junior seau was full of the the, the uh yeah. what are they the the, the the little black dots of the yeah. neurons that have been dot that had been killed yeah. Wow. Anyway, let me uh, can 
Did you have a question? I have lots of questions. Yeah, but me I mean, too. Go, me yeah. too. But, it, okay. but you just hit on omega threes and omega six. Okay, and you called omega three the anti-inflammatory and omega six the inflammatory. Correct. In, infl inflammation. Okay. Yeah. So, in, inflammation. Say that again. It, well, the you know, the, uh, the omega threes promote anti-inflammatory capabilities. Omega sixes promote inflammatory. Right. Right. So you would then, in your case, because of the inflammation in your brain, did I say that you were trying to balance both of those out by taking both or you're taking? No, no, no. I, I take uh, omega threes. I get enough in, in any processed foods of omega sixes that right. I eat, right. which I try not to, but freaking Oreo cookies are so darn good. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? I was going to add, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you. I mean, because I have so many questions. So whichever of this you think is, I don't know, most helpful, most pertinent, like I wanted to know about the the clinical trial, like when that was and what you found in that. And, and was that a medication or was that a lifestyle slash diet change? But then when you're bringing up the processed foods, it makes me wonder about what your diet is uh, because I certainly know that when I'm eating better and and eating actually clean, less fogginess, I feel so much better. Now, do the Oreos taste good? Of course they do. But do I feel better if instead I'm eating fruit and cauliflower and, you know, healthy things? You are spot on. Um, and if you read a book, uh, uh, 2019 Dale Bredesen, B R E D E S E N. Uh, I think it's called the Al Alzheimer's cure. Hmm. Um, mind boggling what's happening in his clinics through lifestyle and diet changes. You are absolutely. And, and when I started, so I watched the movie quiet explosions about probably 20 months ago. And I started, uh, I were started working with the doctor. I sought him out and I sought uh, out one of his uh, underlings, protege. She's a, a psychiatrist down here in, 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 in uh, Punta Gorda in Florida. And um, basically I was eating a very, very good, healthy, clean, not a full keto diet, but darn close. Mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> and, um, and I was doing the omega threes, uh, a large dose of vitamin D for immuno uh, support, immune yep. support, yep. and uh, you, you name it. Some vitamin A, some vitamin K. B, I, I'm d taking a liposomal C, a liquid C that uh, absorbs. You you know supplements. You, you only absorb like up to nineteen percent of the, the the supplements that are on the shelf, the GNCs, mm -hmm. post, partly because the, the molecules of the, of the vitamins themselves are too big to even get into the cell, right? I think they have to be like under like 55 microns or 30 microns or whatever it is. Sure. But the, the nanotechnology and some of these... Um, some of these nutritional supplements is just phenomenal and, and absorb much better in, in, at a cellular level. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so absolutely getting with, involved with that. Um, uh, um, oh, and, and one thing, you know, when you watch, um, when you watch uh, Quiet Explosions, basically Dr. Gordon, he's a endo, um, he's a neuroendocrinologist mm -hmm. and he, totally uh, jives with hormone balance and hormones at the right ranges in your body. And he actually takes a, a, a panel of tw uh, 26 hormones, neurosteroids, neuroactive steroids. He takes it uh, blood every, every quarter. And you take, wow. you try to do it with supplementation. And for instance, if you're testosterone and, and I don't know the, the five different testosterones, T1, T whatever, but mm -hmm. If your testosterone is low, which normally 58 years old, you know, you would expect to be lower or, you know, um, but, um, you know, he, he will suggest, you know, try some pregnenolone and DHEA instead of pellets of testosterone or a shot in the arm of testosterone. Hmm. And do you know the last time I took, took my testosterone after being on the pregnenolone and the DHEA, it was up like it was almost 800, which is very, very good for a 58 year old. Mm -hmm. 
And my buddy, <laughs> my buddy who played the NFL, he says, Frazy, you got to get the pellets. He says, I'm up at, to 1100. I'm like, I'm like, dude, I don't want to have muscles on top of muscles. I'm 58 years old. Yeah. What are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> so I, I'll just stick with, but I, and I don't want a shot and I don't want pellets in my, under my skin. Yeah. 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 I want to take pregnenolone and DHEA because right now that, that helps me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so modalities, it's all the, the mental health too. SSRIs, you know, you know, you, you never, you think about the um, the horror stories of being on, on roller coasters of taking one drug and oh gosh I'm thinking about suicide more. This 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 is terrible, Doc. Okay, well maybe we maybe we try this one. This one's supposed to be good for that. And you go on the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Which one do I take? Well, do you know SSRIs are not only good for about 50% of the population? So mm -hmm. you got a 50-50 chance at best, even before you start the roller roller coaster. So one of the things that Dr. DeMeo, my my doctor, my psychiatrist in Punta Gorda talks about, not, not talks about, but I, I've got BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, neuroplasticity. I'm low genetically. I'm low in that factor. So when I get in the hit in the head, I don't respond as well to to my brain doesn't recover as well. Mm. Yeah. So what do you do for that? You know, so or, or you you don't take certain SSRIs, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Um uh, what is it? MTHFR, the methylfolate, the, the, uh, that gene, uh, what do you mind if you'll indulge me? Yeah. MTHFR. And I'm low on this is an enzyme responsible for the conversion of folic acid to me methylfolate, which is a cofactor needed for serotonin, norepin mm. norepinephrine and dopamine synthesis. Mm. I found out I was, I thought my dopamine had flatlined at 47 years old because I started getting apathetic, but I had that rage mm. too much. To, I do not synthesize dopamine. So my dopamine was too high. Mm. So anxiety, anxiousness, rage, you know, it's all part of it, but so, the supplement, go ahead. Well, I, I, you mentioned your psychiatrist and it sounds like he's, giving you this good information, right. About how your brain works and, and yeah. not just going, well, let's just write you a prescription. Is that the norm? Because no. I, I, no. Okay, so I didn't think so. <laughs> so. So I guess what I'm getting at is because I've, I've not dealt with that type of a doctor before to know what to look for, but I know that just in a, or finding a regular doctor, like a family doctor, it's hard to find someone who is willing to give you a prescription if you need one, but that's not just the go-to. Like the last time I had to find a doctor, I went and I said, listen, I don't come to the doctor for everything. I, every time a kid sneezes, we don't come to the doctor. We aren't going to come in and get strep and flu tests every time somebody's have a sore throat. Like we don't come to the doctor. And I certainly, when we do come, I don't just want you to give me a Z-pack because mm. that's what... Mm everybody, you know, like, Oh, I went to the doctor. I got a Z pack. I'll be fine in three days, you know, like, because yes, that's an answer for some things. No, it's not an answer for everything or everyone. And that took some time to find someone who was going to be honest with that and be good with also saying, well, this could be a supplement that would be helpful in preventing this or preventing that or keeping you healthy so that you're not coming in here <laughs> needing mm -hmm. a Z pack. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so I just wondered what that was like in, in that. So that, that, that's the, the I, I love that story about, you know, so Allison was mama bear. Yeah. And Joshua was her little cub. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'd go into the hospital and he'd have an episode and his lungs would be collapsed. And the doctor, there was one Dr. Sullivan. He's, he's in the book as well. And uh, he, we come in and uh, he just starts ripping off this and that. We and it, start the antibiotics, start this, blah, 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 blah. And, and Alice says, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Wait a minute. 
if the culture comes back that it's a virus, I do not want you to touch him with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Right. If it's a bacteria, absolutely. Give sure. him the antibiotics. So this guy, Dr. Sullivan, he was obviously taken back, but it, it turns out he was from New York too, you know, and Allison's born in Queens, you know, Ozone Park. And <laughs> so, and they locked horns, but he backed off and, um, and he, uh, he had, uh, he, he wrote a little uh, excerpts for in the, in the book. And uh, mm -hmm. he, he talks about, you know, that being involved with a parent that, uh, you know, really knows the child's care, yeah. but um, you know, back to your question. So no, these doctors, the normal, you know, a doctor normally, and, and maybe it's better now, but what you know in, in five or six years of education what did they get one year of uh, one one semester of nutrition mm -hmm. right right and 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 how many psychiatrists actually do or other health healthcare professionals do ev even take in genetics and find out if the ssri that they they prescribe is going to even have an opportunity to work on you sure how many yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't know. My, I, Mizell DeMeo, she's, she's the only one I know right now, but obviously <laughs> there's, there's, but, but, but she, it's all and and Dr. Gordon, you know, he, he has now, you know, he, he's got his panel of 26 neuroactive stories. It's like, so, and, and your thyroid, what is the range, the, the T3 or T4, whatever, let's say the range is like seven to 35 normal range and they get the normal range every 10 years or five years they just take the normal range of a population the the average range of the population that has taken those blood tests during that five years it, it's mm -hmm. crazy how they do that mm -hmm. say it's between seven and and 35 and you're at a eight how many neurologists are going to say yeah you're low normal but you're within the range you i think you're okay mm-hmm no, you're not okay. You're low normal, maybe. And so Dr. Gordon's issue is bring you bring you up to 50 to 75% of that normal range mm -hmm. and give your body what it needs. Mm -hmm. So no, there's not. And he's fighting upstream against yeah. endocrinologists and neurologists. And he's yeah. a neuro endo, right? So right. <laughs> he's got him coming from both sides. Yeah. Paul, how much more time do we have with you? Uh, for the rest, well, actually, I have a, an appointment at two thirty. So. <laughs> so, okay, so we got a little bit of time. We we got a few. I can ask a few more questions. Yeah, absolutely. And don't have to rush this. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I'm going to hesitate to say this. A lot of what you're saying here today, um, I have some of those same things. That's why I hesitate to say it because I make, it makes me vulnerable. You know, mm. the apathy, um, obviously this whole podcast, as you know, was kind of inspired due to, um, something that I experienced a few years ago and, and now we've used it as an opportunity and a platform to seek to serve others. That's what we were talking about the gratitude and empathy coffee. But when you talk about kind of the short fuse and the irritability, but yet the apathy and, and some of those things, I was like, damn. I feel like this guy's talking about me. Um, so if there's anybody else um, who might be experiencing some of this, let's kind of break it down simple um, because you got into a lot of science there. And if anybody yeah. doesn't really track the science, it's kind of going whoosh, right over right. the head. Right. Understood. So when you talk about nutrition, let's talk, let's kind of look at like, what does, I don't know. I don't want to put you on the hook for a week, but like, what when you are planning out your meals or you're planning out the nutrition of your day, you know, like let's break it down black and white to what you are doing from that standpoint and then the amount of supplements that you're taking. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you two uh times in my life where I have uh, really been strict on my diet, dietary intake. One when I was playing, um, and I for about uh, eight months. I did um, I did uh, vegetables and meats and a, a potato twice a week, yeah. and I didn't I didn't deal with the I did I didn't, just a baked potato like a loaded baked, baked potato yeah uh, butter 
and sour cream. Love, love. Okay. Right. Man, you don't I didn't have the and cheese on it. You can put chives on it and maybe a little bit of cheese, whatever. Right. But um, um, you say no to the bacon. That's really what I'm hearing there. Well, <laughs> the bacon, Dr. Gordon. He, he, I went to see Dr. Gordon at a, at a con continuing education program uh, a year ago, and I'm going back uh, April 11th down to, to uh, Fort Lauderdale. He saw me in the, in the next morning. He says, uh, uh, go switch to turkey bacon because Ooh. I had like five pieces of nice you know, crispy bacon on my mm -hmm. on my plate. Oh. But the the stuff they process it, that that in is just bad for us. It's gotcha. it's just as bad as the high fructose corn syrup and the uh, the Oreo cookies. Okay. So okay. You know, get, get get the Paul Newman uh, you know cream cookies or whatever they write. Gotcha. So, All right. So anyway, anyway so moving on to vegetables and meat. I I did that for eight months. I I dropped probably five percent body fat. I thought so clearly you could i i was back to my you know I, I my thought process was clear and concise i've done kind of a keto a very close to to a keto diet for about eight months um just uh, two years ago when or a year and a half ago when i started taking the supplements man i have a a, a tremor in my right hand it's called and and i had i had i had two two strokes in seven days, six, uh, six years ago. Oh and I lost my speech. Right. Um, but through that, I was in the Mayo clinic for five, five days R really quick. I drank too much. Right. Mm -hmm. I told you that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you did, yeah. And I had been on the 12 step program probably for about, uh, seven or eight years. And I, I'd get, I'd get a few months sober and then I'd, get i'd pick up right and i actually got uh, um so i say i say i was sober for seven years because i only drank three to 35 times in seven years and that's only five times a year so you're sober right mm -hmm. <laughs> after my second stroke in se seven days uh, an ischemic stroke that took my speech fortunately it did not take my left side paralysis this and so on and so forth but i had to re relearn how to talk over wow. about seven seven or eight months oh my gosh um and, and there's a story to that but um that night i'm standing in the mayo and i'm i'm looking out the window it's dark i'm about by myself and i say if i keep doing that i'm dead i want the opportunity to walk my daughter down the aisle mm. boom. boom that's what did it the miracle they say in the 12 step program, don't leave the rooms before the miracle happens. Well, that was my miracle. <laughs> um, so, so I've done, I did the keto diet. I, I watched quiet explosions. You, you say simple, 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 break it down, watch quiet yeah. explosions, period. Okay. Um, and then, then start in your journey. Um, but I was doing a kind of, kind of a keto diet about 18 months ago. I was on the supplements. I was taking the uh, omega threes, uh, omega uh, uh, A, uh, an A, vitamin A, vitamin K, vitamin C, vitamin D, and I also take. Uh, I had uh, Synthroid uh, for my thyroid and uh, Metoprolol. I've I've got uh, um, AFib, um, so. Uh, I take that and all that stuff. So, uh, but through the, I was standing in the Mayo Clinic before I left the Mayo Clinic. I said I needed to get a movement specialist because I, I had a tremor in my right hand, mm -hmm. and I was like, I I want to, do I have Parkinson's? And he ruled it out. He saw me. He says, No, you you have familial tremors. And my dad. At 89, he can't even hold a cup of coffee, coffee. Okay. but his mind is just clear and concise, and that, that's all he has. Right? Yeah. And uh, but I, when when I 18 months ago, I got on the kind of keto diet, pretty much a keto diet, and those supplements. Hmm. No tremors. No so, tremors, yeah. right? Wow. Yeah. So so is it helping? Yeah, it's helping somehow, mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. I mean, you, if you look inside my brain, I think I'm I, my executive function is getting a little bit better. Um, I'm still flat line kind of. I have mo more emotions, but 
I, I know a lot of the SSRIs and stuff that, and for, first of all, I, I, I genetically, I don't, I don't do well with SSRIs. And, and right now I don't, I'm not depressed. I've never had any suicide ideation. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm just happy there's, there are modalities. And if I get strict and if I get really on, on, on point, mm -hmm. I feel really good. And I feel yeah. a lot better than I did five, eight years ago. Um, you know, two years ago. Hmm. I'm going to get in the weeds a little bit more with your diet. So because of the concern of all the different processed few, uh, foods and they talk about all the herbicides and things that are on the food or <clears throat> on foods out there these days, like how, how uh, strict or detailed are you getting when you're actually shopping, when you're grocery shopping? Are you going to the farmer's market to get that kind of stuff? Are you getting um, uh, organic the vegetables? Like you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, ha I, I have not. We, we have a Whole Foods, you know, 35 miles away. I'll shop there once a month. <laughs> okay. Um, what, what I really try to do is I try, I do try to stay away from the Oreo cookies and the, um, but every once in a while, I'll, I'll do well for about eight weeks, maybe, maybe 10 weeks. And then I'll go on a binge of, you know, sweets and this yeah. and that, yeah. and, but I, 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 absolutely <clears throat> the brain fog comes back yeah the the the, the lethargicness yeah sometimes you kind of e even in your eyes and you can feel after you've eaten really strict and healthy for yeah. eight weeks you you feel great but if you if you binge on crap yeah you start kind of, uh, you mean you those know. inflammatory foods cause no. inflammation yeah. like in, in your whole body? Like that other people Preach even it. notice? Preach it sister. Yeah. yeah. So you don't get real strict then. I mean, you can go into your local, you know, um, here it's, it's like a price chopper or a high V maybe it's, I don't know what, what would be like a big I'm, chain of grocery stores that you have Publix, up there. Probably. Publix, Publix. Yeah. Okay, so you'll go yeah. in there and you'll just get your regular tomatoes and potatoes and and yeah. cucumbers yeah. and all that. Like you're not real specific on the type of vegetables, even the meats for that matter. Like, are you are you seeking out specific chicken or beef? If if I I don't eat a lot of beef, but if I do beef, I, I definitely do the um, non hormone. You know. Uh, uh, you know the the beef grass fed, fed non hormone yeah. you know stuff like that yeah um but i i don't if i i can promise you if i had if i would get strict to the t it's it, our our mental our mental health is really we lie to ourselves all the time yeah i'm feeling better so i'm I'm doing what better. So I don't have to be that strict strict right. because that's going to drive me nuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No yeah. Doubt. No and doubt. I'm depriving myself, right? I'm depriving myself. Well, you, you <laughs> just the, the, with the drinking, it, it, it came to, you know, I've been a good boy, you know, I can mm -hmm. have, I can have uh, whatever, but uh, um, so I, I don't get strict, but I, I have some friends that are, shop at whole foods organic yeah. everything yeah and and they're they're just pictures of health yeah yeah and but but i will tell you i when i get on the binge i definitely say you know what enough is enough this is ridiculous i want to get back to feeling better so i i, I mean do. having this conversation with you and just kind of again sharing that i have some of those i don't know if characteristics yeah. is the right term to use but like the same um feelings uh it's inspiring me to like go to uh our local whole foods place because yeah. i want to go to that level just to yeah. go try it out you know because i'm because what honestly, would it hurt really well and it's kind of like just a i'm not, i don't want to say that i'm too at a like i'm back to where i was mm -hmm. but i definitely feel like i'm up against it like mm -hmm. uh, something that's got to change i got to make a change yeah. and well and it's gotten to the point to where i the apathy has set in so much to where i've lost my desire to eat like yeah. i don't have mm -hmm. a like for example we had pot roast last night that mm -hmm. was made in the slow cooker mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i didn't eat any of it 
I had a really small lunch and last night I was just like, man, I just don't have an appetite. And, and I, but you know, one thing I did find myself having an appetite for last night as I was watching the McBee dynasty, <laughs> oh. the nutter butters or whatever the heck yeah. they're called, you know, ah. you know something right. like a sweet, you know, yeah. I was like, Oh yeah, I got, I'm not starving, but I right. kind of feel a little, but this will kind yeah. of tied me over, you know? And, and so oh. I guess where I'm ultimately going is, is, is you're kind of, you know, saying all this, it's like, it hit me square right between the eyes. I'm like, damn, Did I'm, I'm going through this really 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 quick you know to the sweets and the the proteins and stuff you, if you you know the whole thing about you know the sweets and the um um diabetes and stuff you know um if you eat your when you eat sweets when you break down and eat sweets make sure you have had some protein or you eat protein with it because that actually lowers the glycemic index mm -hmm. charge that your body goes through yeah wow. you know give okay. me insulin 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 uh, uh, no it, it kind of balances out no but to your point i'm not a hundred percent back i don't do a hundred percent strict but i absolutely feel better when i do when i'm doing the right things period yeah yeah period and 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 the the apathy and the you know okay watch quiet explosions because yeah. You don't have to bang your head to get TBI. Mm. You don't. In in the movie, one one um, girl, she was in college. She was raped. They he attributed they they had a conversation. The girl and Doctor Corden, and he said, "No, you don't have to get hit in the head. A rape could absolutely you know, a traumatic situation trauma, can yeah. absolutely start the cascade of the the the, the, the cytokine storm in your brain." Mm bad you know so any trauma losing a son losing yeah. a child yeah you know i mean it could be just as something as simple as you know a highly stressful job i would think even as yes. well you know like yes. hey there's a deadline and this is what is yes. being expected of me and if i don't get this by done by then i'm going to lose my job and then i can't provide for my family um the, the I was, stresses of a marriage or you know like there's just a lot of different stresses that are out there that could also be a contributor to this exactly i, I literally was just talking to a friend of mine he's a c-level executive and through covid he was he he, he struck you know he was strong it out and went in the job every day and they hit, people were dropping left and right and yeah. get, you know getting COVID. and but but he's he's having he, he had an anxiety attack for the first time ever mm just recently and i said dude go watch quiet explosions <laughs> um, I, sorry i just i gotta get i gotta get no. these out all right yeah. so thank you for giving me kind of some clarity on my ability to go uh grocery shopping because uh that's giving me some <laughs> new inspiration and and think about can i just yeah, on, the, yeah. on that just real quick yeah. is i've heard someone say that you just need to stick it doesn't mean that everything on the perimeter of the grocery store is is good good yeah, for you yeah but if you right. just avoid all the middle aisles <laughs> no, I was thinking about it. it's no, true no, because no, that's true. where the crap is yeah, like that's where sure. the cake mix i mean that's where the cake mixes are and the cookies and the gatorade and the coke and all the things you know yeah, like you got yeah. meat and vegetables and dairy and sure fresh bakery so just thought the vitamins the supplements yeah. um i wanted to get into that because i think that that's an area of which i'm lacking and, and you kind of hit to it earlier i think when we were younger and i certainly in my parents or our parents generation you know there wasn't as many supplements there wasn't as many vitamins because they were getting more nutrients in the actual foods that they were eating come on now we had flintstone chewable vitamins we Didn't did have, have those, those. <laughs> we had those but now you've got i mean i you no, should I go upstairs and see the amount of things that we are pumping through our child's but it's all good things yeah but we didn't have that and we yeah. didn't need it because we were getting exposed to more nutrients i think in our foods um there's a thing out there that uh, um i used to take and I, I don't know why i got off of it but it's a, it's a company called juice plus yeah um, mm -hmm. and so our uh, family is uh been taking that and and i know that's been beneficial and so i need to get back on that anyway the point where i'm going with this is is that you talked about the breakdown of the actual vitamins uh, being just a very small percentage because the because the the uh, the, the absorption is too big right the absorption right. right so what does your daily intake i mean you mentioned the vitamin c and d and a and b and you know the entire alphabet basically um <laughs> what what does that 
look like if you were talking, okay, you're talking to me, somebody who's now openly telling you that he's kind of going through some of these things. Is there a certain, do you go to your doctor to get prescribed vitamins? Cause I know that is a thing. Or are you actually going to your GNC or some particular? I go, I, so, so I get my, uh, some of my vitamins from the vitamin shop. Um, the, the D because, uh, the, um, you know, you can't get, so I take a slow release D it's a 50,000 I use. Yeah. That's what and, I have to do. Yeah. And that is a script. Uh, is it a script up in It's KC? not. No, I was really? going to tell you, I know of a couple places I can okay. help you really? with where to get good, like okay. good quality vitamins, but okay. I, I still want you to answer for everyone else. Yeah. So, so, but I, the life extension, I, I, I have their omega threes that, that I use and I use the pregnenolone and the, uh, um, the DHEA from life extensions. It's a blue, blue, uh, label, uh, you can get it on Amazon. Now, Dr. Gordon has his, his line of vitamins, but his ministry is PTSD and veterans. Hmm. And, and, and quite frankly, when I started this program, I didn't have a I didn't have the means to spend an extra $8 on a bottle of for, for the veterans. But so I had to go to a, a kind of a discount and get the same product. But my, I, I've, I've actually donated to Dr. Gordon's to the veterans cause mm -hmm. because he gives a lot of veterans free service for uh, his hormone panels and so on and so on and so forth. Hmm. And he's he's helped a, a tremendous amount of uh, PTSD um, vets. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really in some some vitamins. So the, the, the vitamin C, I, I started taking a liposomal uh, Dr. Mercola's. It's a big, thick, you know, gooey. It's like a it's like a, a Gatorade uh, pa a packet, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really good, and it's the, the, the absorption, absorption rate is phenomenal. Okay. So that's why I take it. Uh, you know, so I've, I've kind of looked through and so you what you, somebody calls me and they say, well, what, what do you take, Paul? What do you, you know, like, I'm not a doctor. I'm not yeah. even a nutritionist. Yeah. I know a lot about it because, you know, the, the TBI is because I've really studied it and I'm trying to figure it out and trying to, I back to, okay. Maybe, maybe you can, you know, tell me I have it, you know, you're, you're worried about telling me I have it. No, just tell me how to tell me how to get to the root of it. Yeah. Not take a pill just to mask the symptoms, right. but go down to, to the root of it and get rid of the inflammation that's causing the tau protein to stay in my brain and start killing off my neurons. Because I don't, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to put my family through that. I want to, mm -hmm. I want to live a, the average life expectancy of a, of a lineman uh, in the NFL uh, that, that played over three years is 58 years old, 57 Ooh. years old, 57 years old. I'm going to beat that by probably three or four decades, but I want my brain to be intact mm -hmm. and I don't want to be a, a sure. burden on anybody. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and it's your own quality of life too. Like, I mean, yeah. I know that when I'm feeling those symptoms that you described earlier, like I can't help it. I'm feeling that, but at the same time, I don't like it either, you know? And you know, you, you, you gosh, yeah. I'm real vulnerable yeah. here, but like yeah. when you talk about the rage or the anger, like, um, I don't like feeling that way. And I don't like knowing that I'm potentially exposing that behavior to my children, you know? So you, it's, 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 you know, you're talking about all of the other people that it could be affecting, but it's also your own quality of life. Yeah. The, the one thing re to, regarding the anger. So I told you at 47, 48, I started raging, you know, and I, I, I just didn't care. You're going to listen to me. Well, when I started, got into the clinical trials and I started looking at the uh, uh, CTE symptom, symptoms of uh, Mayo and U uh, Boston University, I start and I started realizing what CTE is. I started you know, okay, it's not organic to the point where I can't make a cognitive decision to do this or to do that. Or can I stop getting angry like that? And I had gone, I, I, I started getting angry like that probably once every two weeks. And then when I understood what I'm dealing with, it went to once a month. 
and then it went to six one, once every six months. And and th listen, my daughter, my daughter, at four, 15 years old, my daughter said, "Yeah, you just walk out that front door. You you just ignore." Blah, blah, blah. Mm. And I'm like thinking as I'm walking out the door, I said, "You don't want me in this house." right now yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i start and i walked out the door now that's after understanding what cte is and how it affects you and understanding oh do i have the cog cognitive ability to do this or change my mind or make a decision or am i in it advanced alzheimer's where i don't know where i am i don't even know who you are you know, CTE, yeah. Alzheimer's, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But so I started understanding I can actually make the decision to walk out the front door. And I mm -hmm. did. Now I get angry like that once a year. I let myself go there. And and when I go there, I'm like, I feel like crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My head is pounding. I just made it ASS of myself. <laughs> Who saw that? What a jerk. And yeah. then the, all the self-deprecating, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then and then go back to read Norman Vincent Peale, Power of Positive Thinking. <laughs> Gosh. Lord. <laughs> well, speaking of Lord, I was going to ask about faith, like how that how that's played. Like where, where, I guess, where did that start? Where did you grow I'm a up? I'm a preacher's kid, so I had no choice. A PK. Right. And then I, and then I, and it probably, and uh, at 21, 22, I started reading uh, the uh, uh, Quran. The, uh, I started uh, reading, you know, about Buddha and this and that. And I, I wanted to understand all of this stuff. And basically I just came back to, it makes a lot more sense than everything that's out out there and i had i had a relation i have a relationship with 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 jesus christ and and we're called to follow the nazarene so i'm i'm like i you see atheists in some of the 12 step rooms and stuff you know it's like all, all we're called to do is follow the nazarene you know and he there's not one thing that he says in that book that will make you do this, this, and this, and this, and, mm -hmm. and, and end up in prison. <laughs> right. um, no, faith, faith has been very important. There's, there's, um, I, I'm so happy to, you know, say that my daughter is, she's with a, a Christian ministry out, out in California. Oh, nice. And, um, and she works closely with the, that group. And, uh, um, yeah, I mean, faith, when, when Joshua, again, when I accepted the fact that Joshua was ready, again, uh, Dad, did you see what God did mm -hmm. after Lou Giglio, you know, doing his old thing? I was just so amazed that, mm -hmm. uh, just so, so amazed that I mean, you, you just, in, in, Every time we open our eyes, you walk outside and you open your eyes. How how can this be random? Mm -hmm. This is this is orchestrated to the mm -hmm. T, to mm -hmm. the T. So, and I just I just try to love on people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I you know, I it's know. incredible. Um, mm -hmm. what a great conversation. Very enlightening. Um. I know we've got just a few minutes here with you, so I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity to talk about sports. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Normally, we would have started off with sports, and then, but how many times has that bit me in the rear? You know, like when we had yeah. Ryan Lefevre, yeah. who was a sports uh, broadcaster for the Royals, we wanted yeah. to talk to him about mental health and the things that he went through, but I spent an hour talking about his experiences being a broadcaster. And anyway, so... Uh, we'll wrap up with some of these uh, conversations about sports. First of all, where did you play college? Syracuse. Syracuse. So you are a, a Northeastern. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Going North to the Jets was like staying home then. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I grew up in New Hampshire, was born in Elmira, New York, where Ernie Davis was born, I guess. So 
and uh, the um, the train or whatever, whatever they they made a movie about him. Okay. He and I didn't even when I went to Syracuse, I didn't realize he was the first black uh, Heisman Trophy winner. I believe. Oh, oh okay. So a um, lot of. Uh, and, and then you start getting introduced to, uh, yes, Syracuse, sorry. <laughs> okay, no, it's all right. It was all right. And so you were a defensive lineman there as well? Yes. I was, yep. a t- I was brought in as a tight end my, in my first year, and, and I had never blocked before. I was always a defensive lineman in high school. And, uh, okay. um, yeah, they, they, they brought me. George um, O'Leary was my defensive line coach. Wow. And, yeah and he's he's psychotic and uh and uh but uh but he was he was the reason i think he was the re he's he was such a great technician he was the reason i got in, into the nfl i think okay so the whenever i hear the name george o'leary i immediately think of the guy who fabricated his resume to get a job at notre dame he would have brought notre dame back to the forefront really he not lied about what who he, no I mean, yeah. it was a fake college yeah. like there was he put a i don't know if you know about this mm-hmm. but he had actually put on there like his resume of the teams that he had coached and he put on a team that didn't even exist <laughs> am i right is, is that well, how it went i thought well i thought it was so he played at the university of new hampshire it was, he was a quarterback but he i don't think he lettered and i think he uh, you know on his resume he said he was a lettering four-time oh, lettering and this okay. and that all but he had been uh he had been hired by notre dame yeah he would have he would have been i mean he's a great coach so when you call him psychotic is that the word you used oh yeah he yeah. will so he, what is give me a, well, give me a story so, so about that in the dome at syracuse we had the dome right and if it was a horrible a snowstorm or a horrible rainstorm they would take us to the dome to practice in the dome okay. and uh o'leary and they didn't have the sleds the dummy sleds in the in the so he had us actually hand shivering and putting our forehead into the concrete wall at the stands the defensive line right <laughs> well that, and, um, no wonder you have cte <laughs> <laughs> no I'm but he he no he was a great technician he was a master at uh the psychology of the game okay and he was a brilliant x's and o's um but i i think i don't well, know i saw him pick up an eight millimeter one of those old reel to reel eight millimeter and i he, he threw it about 15 feet into the wall oh, <laughs> oh my, my goodness and it was only practice oh my <laughs> only, only alan iverson practice We're yeah about right practice. right exactly but i guess he got his message across that, oh, yes, uh, yes. that, she, that he was we won off. yeah we won that next week mm-hmm. um and then he went on and had a pretty solid career at Georgia Tech, I remember. Then that's when he think was going to Notre Dame, lost that as quickly as he got it. And then wasn't he spending some time UCF. in like Central Florida? Huh? UCF, UCF. Yeah, Central Florida. He ended up he ended up um they have a statue of him. He he was twelve and one there. He he, he had yeah. them ranked ranked. Yeah. With all the Miamis and the Florida States and the Gators yeah. and, and 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 uh the uh, South Florida over in Tampa, they had a couple of good good years, and then Central Florida, O'Leary brought them, brought them to prominence. Wow! I just sat with George, uh, oh, probably two years ago. He he lives down here in Palm Coast in Florida. Hmm. So, doing well. He's doing okay. Okay, how old is he now? He's got to be seventy eight, probably. Yeah. I just talked to uh, Tom Coughlin the other day too. Well, uh, I gave him one uh, one of the books, one of oh. Joshua's stories. He, he and Judy, he was a tyrant on the field too. He was kind of psychotic too, but I got to meet him off the field because Joshua was going down one time and we were losing him. And he and he Tom and Judy came over to the hospital and sat with us for probably a couple hours. Mm-hmm. Wow! And Tom didn't talk about football. Mm. And yeah. You, you, uh, I was eventually going to get to Tom Coughlin because in the, uh, you've referenced him a couple times in this discussion and they didn't come across as flattering and you, when you brought up his name. And, and, and honestly, I wasn't surprised because being a, a close follower to sports as I am, um, there's, there's a lot of, um, I'm trying to say it politically correct here, but there, there's a lot of documented stories about the relationships that he had with players and 
basically describing them the same way that you did. Um, so you talked about earlier in this discussion, how he shipped you off to green Bay because he didn't think you were good enough, but then, which allowed me to think, okay, Paul does not think very highly of Tom, but then you just kind of said something somewhat flattering there about him. So what is your true feelings for Tom Coughlin? Tom is a, is a wonderful uh, person. Okay. Absolutely. He was a tough coach, but he, you knew you didn't, he didn't mince words at play games. You knew exactly what he needed and what he wanted, or you knew if you didn't give it to him, you were gone or just, yeah. If, 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 when he did so for two years, I was with the Jaguars, and he he liked me as a player because I busted my butt. Mm -hmm. I was a blue collar, but I just I would run, I would sprint from drill to drill. I was I was kind of crazy. They call, called me Sparky down here at <laughs> uh, you know in, in my ninth year, eighth the ninth year. But um, but Tom was a bear as as a he was. 11, 11 o'clock at night. I mean, five in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, football, boom. And he never wavered. Mm -hmm. It's football, football, football. Mm -hmm. But again, I met him off the football field and he, his wife is a, was a saint. She passed away uh, last year. And Tom was a good, good soul, good heart person. He actually lost one of his uh, defensive backs at Boston College when he was there, and he still does a, a, the J Fund. He actually still raises money for families going through uh, cancer situations. Hmm. So, so um, is the criticism of him that we see in the media or from other players that have played for him fair? Um, it, no, it, it, not totally. I mean, he, he's a, he, he's a bear, but not mm -hmm. totally. I, I remember I, I was actually sitting with him, um, at an event and Floyd Little and some other Syracuse guys were there. Um, and, and Tom was, he was hurt when Tiki Barber, when the, he was with the giants and Tiki yep. Barber kind of said some really derogatory yep. things about him. Yep. And Tom was hurt. Tom was saying, I don't know why he, he did that to me. You know, I was just trying to make the team, you know, and and that was the time when uh, Jeremy Shockey, that that basket case from Miami. Yep. You know, he was a he was a loose cannon. Yep. And you you a, a, a player like Jeremy Shockey doesn't is not going to do well on a, under a Tom Coughlin really quick. I so I left. So Tom it literally traded me the day before the final cut in my third preseason with the Jaguars. I went home. Joshua was not doing well. I went from Jacksonville to Dallas and I said, coach, I'll be back on Tuesday. You know, when we get started again, he says, make sure you're back on Tuesday, Paul. I land and I walk in the front door in Dallas, 15 minutes from the uh, DFW. And Allison answers the phone, phone rings. Allison answers the phone and she says, Paul, it's Tom. He says, Hey, I'm like, Hey coach, never, never would have been, never expected to call from, you know, to my home in Dallas. Sure. He says, Paul, I wanted to give you a chance to go to the Super Bowl. I, we just traded you to green Bay and you, you they're expecting you uh, t tomorrow. Mm. And I'm like, you could have told me that eight hours ago. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt. Do you think he knew eight hours prior to that? Yeah, he had an idea. Yeah, yeah. But but they they I'm sure I'm sure I had some coaches, you know, battling for me in in the rooms and, you know, and Tom just figured, you know, he needed to go. So. So, Tom, when I came in to uh, to the Jaguars, I had a full beard and a long ponytail. OK, long, long hair. <laughs> and uh, Bill Pickell used to call me the, the, the Nazarene. And I'm like, dude, come on. Oh, wow. So. <laughs> Coughlin, that, that first month, you know, I was walking past him in the morning to the weight room and he was on a treadmill and he looks at me, he says, you need a haircut and a shave. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm 28, 29 years old. And mm -hmm. I need a haircut and a shave. Okay. He doesn't talk to me for a week. Doesn't even look at me. I shaved my beard and I cut about two inches off my hair. And he said, and the next time I see him, he looks up, he says, that's a start. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Did you get shaved and cut two inches off your hair because of him? Oh yeah. Okay. And <laughs> so he and got to you. I went when he said that's a start. Yeah. I went and cut the rest of my hair off. I had a buzz cut, and the, the only guy that had long hair didn't make the team. He was one hell of a player too. Oh. But wow. but so 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 Tom would, if he got on your bad, if you got on his bad side, he yeah. would not. He would. Wow. When I went to Green Bay. Holmgren, I was shocked. Holmgren could get as hot as Tom. I mean, rip you up one side down the yeah, other. Yeah. But Holmgren, three minutes after he rips you up one side of the other, he literally would walk up to you, put his hand on your shoulder, and says, "Okay, you understand uh, why why we do it this way? You, you you understand? You know this and that. You know. So you know, how's your how, how's your family? You doing okay?" You know, kind, of, kind of a firm fatherly approach yeah. as opposed to a drill sergeant that you <laughs> right. had with Tom, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. interesting. You brought up a few other people that you played with in Green Bay that obviously um, sparked my interest. One of it was Gilbert Brown. We're yeah. familiar with him around here, although I'm a huge K-State fan. I'm very familiar with the fact that Gilbert played at the University of Kansas for Terry Mason. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so i uh, love to hear some stories about him and possibly uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you have at least one or two stories about Reggie White. Uh, I. Trying to pick a story, a story about it, Reggie. <laughs> no, Reggie was just absolutely. Uh, he would he would be hilarious in the locker rooms. Um, there was a linebacker from the Bronx, and um, they would go back and forth, and, and Reggie was saying, "You're you're going to hell if you don't." This and, that. and he would go back at him. You know, there was all like tongue in cheek, and it was just yeah. funny. But but he was the minister of defense. He was no a, doubt. But um, what a what a so I was up there by myself. Allison and Josh were down in in, in uh, Florida. Yeah. I spent Thanksgiving Day and Christmas Day with with the whites. No with way. Reggie and his oh. wife and his two kids. And I just just one the only other you know, player that got to do that. What's that? Did he bring over anybody no. else on the team that was no, about themselves, no. he, or was it just you? No, he knew that I had uh, my family was uh, down in Florida, and he says, "Paul, uh, please come over." And and it was me and the whites. Wow. Mm. Um, just a genuine, sweet spirited guy. Just just a good good man. Gilbert was funny. The chili they call him chill chili. Okay. Gilbert Brown uh, and. Uh, uh, Santana Dodson was a number one pick from Tampa. He was playing with us, you know, that Green Bay had picked him up in the free, free agency, I think. And, uh, so Gabe Wilkins, um, yeah, it was just, just, it was a wonderful, it was such, so, such a cool experience. And I was, I was thinking about five years ago, I was thinking, you know what? I got to play with two of arguably two of the best, people in the NFL to ever play their position. Uh, Reggie yeah. White, Reggie White, I, I backed him up. And then I had to play against Tony Baselli. Uh, his first two years, uh, he was the left tackle that just made the Hall of Fame uh, from, from the uh, Jaguars. Uh -huh. So, and he was, he was by far, he was the best one I had ever played against. And mm -hmm. I played against Tun Chilkin, um, Munoz, I played against one time. Um, Zimmerman, I played against a few times from Denver. So, so anyway, yeah, I, I said, Terry Mason, it's actually Glenn Mason. I knew as soon as I said that, that that didn't sound right. So I had to go look at it. Yeah. Quick, but he played for Glenn Mason, the head coach of at KU at the time. Um, certainly <clears throat> there has to be a Brett Favre story. Yeah. Um, or were you, you, was that, was, or did you have magic then? No, no, no. Brett, Brett uh, Doug Peterson was still backing up. Oh, Brett that's Favre. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, I got there after they beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. I got there the year that we lost to Denver. Gotcha. Oh. And Brett, Brett had uh, cleaned up his act. He, he was off the pills and this mm -hmm. and that. And he was the first thing I remember. The first day I was there, he was actually handing out his book. Let you know, you know, everybody made the team that year. I mean, it was that day final cuts and he was handing out his book and stuff. And I read, read his book on, on the plane to the, uh, the second game, a great guy. All I can say is you've seen him in the Wrangler commercials. Yep. 
That's Brett Favre. Okay. Now, obviously, he had some off-field shenanigans, you know, after mm-hmm. with the Jets and this mm-hmm. and you know, crazy stuff, whatever. But yeah, he he was a non-pretentious, just just a solid, good good teammate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that and I never I never hung on with him. Obviously, he had uh, the stories. I never hung with him during the time when all the stories were, you know, crazy. <laughs> yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Well, and your time in Green Bay was short lived too, right? Like, so exactly. you didn't really have a, a ample amount of time to go down yeah. that road. <clears throat> so, um, well, let me, I guess um, you might have some questions, but I'll, my final question, I guess, is just like, what is the most memorable of the 11 seasons? What is the most memorable? Well, I mean, probably, I mean, there's kind of two, you know, with the Jaguars, our second year, both the the Jaguars and then Carolina, we made it to the AFC and the NFC championship. And that was pretty cool cool with a new young team uh, getting to be a part of that, you know, being one of the oldest on the team, you know, Yeah. Um, because when you're, you're in your very first training camp and you're sitting next to a Marty Lyons and he's played 12 years, you're, you're, you're scratching your head saying, how the heck has he done this for 12 years, right? Um, but obviously that next year when we went to the Super Bowl um, with Green Bay, that was pretty darn cool. That experience playing behind Reggie White and actually, uh, you know, playing with the great Brett Favre. Mm-hmm. I mean, the first play I ever saw him do was on Monday night. Uh, the, the Bears came to Lambe- Lambeau to open the season Monday night. I saw Brett on the 49 yard line sprinting to the right and then just take it. Boom. Yeah. And that ball went you right. What year would that corner. have been? What what's that? What year was that? That was uh 97 season, okay. 98 Super Bowl. Wow. And I saw that ball sail 49 yards, 40, 50 yards, right one yard inside at the corner of the end zone. And Antonio Freeman scooped it off the ground. Yeah. with his hands like that and touchdown i'm like yeah. oh my gosh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's insane so the, those you know obviously making to the to the super bowl after uh 10 years in the league yeah was phenomenal but we lost yeah and that was that was hard sure mm. so you meant I'll, I'll just ask this um i said that was the last question so this is the last question all right because i'm sitting here we got 10 minutes before you have to do the next thing um you mentioned like to, in your career, you were doing this because you needed the insurance. Um, were you still able to enjoy the game? Were you, were you, were you doing it only or were you miserable playing the game because of what you, the, the feeling of necessity that the league was able to or provide? It was the necessity that the league was able to provide. It probably, my mindset probably cut, cut my career short uh, a year but also I had back surgery in year 10 mm. when I was playing for Green Bay and uh, I could never get my legs strong enough and back, back in shape uh, after mm. I had back surgery. I played 40 days after back surgery and um, played in the, uh, in the playoffs. Um, so yeah, that it was hard. It was hard. And, 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 and when, when I, I got cut for the very first time in my 11th training camp, and it was with Green Bay. And um, I remember going, I, I knew I was on the bubble and on the brink of getting cut. And we were coming back from Denver. And I went, I went, uh, I literally went up to first class and, and Mark, Mike Holmgren was sitting there with Ron Wolf, you know, scratching people off the thing and highlighting. And he was so shocked that I would come up and he was like hiding the paper. And I said, coach, I said, you know, if, if you're going to, this was the first cut that year. I said, if you're going to cut me, you know, if you're thinking of cutting me, I, I would appreciate you cut cutting me, you know, uh, sooner than later. And so I can get the opportunity to get on with another team. Yeah. And I, and so I went back that night to, uh, to, uh, um, you know, I, I, we were right on the, uh, there was a co- college campus right there and it was on the water and there was a dock and i remember i remember going i was i laid on my back and the stars were just brilliant and I, and i just sat there and i'm like i knew i knew and 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 i and i 
I wasn't sad. I wasn't, I mean, it was just very, very mel melancholy. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Kind of just, mm, it's, it's over. Mm -hmm. yes. And then I went, then I, the next day, bring your playbook. Coach wants to see you. Mm. And then you get, you get your roadmap and an apple. And uh, they send you home. And then I sat on the, well, I, I worked out, but I sat on the couch the next five Sundays saying, wow, it's over. You know, 20 years of organized football, 11 years in the, or, or 10 years in the NFL, it's over. And then I got called on week uh, five and Baltimore needed a long snapper. Okay. Okay. <laughs> An average long snapper. And uh, I went. And uh, I would say it was probably all smoke and mirrors, but I went and I did, I did my duty and, and then nobody ever called me back after that. All right. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I have a question I wanted to ask earlier. Um, do you have any grandchildren yet? No. Okay. Isabella. Yeah. You know, she's, she's, uh, I told, I started telling her that, at like 14, 50 years old, I said, Isabella, you know, boys don't, their brains don't mature until at least 28 or 30. <laughs> and I said, years will mature about uh, 24, 25. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she, she, after her freshman year at Liberty, right, she's driving home and she calls me. She says, dad, do you remember you've been telling me, you know, boys brains don't mature, you know, until, you know, 30. Yeah. And I said, oh yeah. And she says, that is so true. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the reason I asked that is because I thought maybe you would have some like um, inspiration behind the answer to this question. But so picture, you know, a grandson in the future, if, if you will. Um, would you want them playing football, tackle football? I, I would say not until they're in, well into high school. Okay. Play, play flag football, save your brain. Yeah. And yeah, that, that's, that, what, right is that now, even possible? I that? mean, being the, the just where the, in yeah. the direction of where American football is going, you know, yeah. flag football is obviously a youth organization very, very early on, yeah. but, yeah. but they're bringing in and implementing the pads and tackle football at a much earlier age. Yeah. And so I don't even know that flag football is even offered you know, through junior high or those seventh, eighth grade years before not you get that into, I know of, but right. I didn't look into it either. So then you're so. kind of, well, and I'm not trying to challenge your answer to this, but I'm just trying to get your input or some clarity to it because anybody then who's trying to get into football, you I mean like, like it's unfortunate that high school sports has turned into almost like a one sport for most kids. Mm. When I was playing, you got to play. Right. I played everything. Yeah. But now if you want to be good at it or be taken seriously, you yeah. almost have to treat that one sport as the only sport that you're going to play. Yeah. Thoughts and opinions on kind of the the direction of which youth sports is going? Uh, you, you're, I think it's crazy that they only play one uh, sport now. I, I wish that they would get diversified. Um, I, I thought my, so I, I'm, I'm up in New Hampshire growing up in New Hampshire and I get discovered, um, in, you know, for college football or for a scholarship. And, uh, um, I thought my daughter down here in Florida would get discovered and you know, she was good enough to play volleyball, probably D2, but these kids are coached from seven and eight years old on up for one sport. Mm -hmm. And I never did that. Yeah. I knew, but why, why do you need it? If you're good enough, you're going to get discovered. No, that's not the case. I think mm -hmm. it's way too. Oh, it, and, and, and my daughter at 13 years old has to freaking fly to Chicago to get, get in a volleyball tournament. Can't we find enough 13 year olds down here in Jacksonville? Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Right. It's ridiculous. But it's all money. It's all. Yep. It's driven. <laughs> um, football. Fly, flag football is huge down here in Florida. Okay. Um, maybe it's the warm weather. I don't know. Um, you guys are in football heaven right now. That, that's for sure. You know, yeah. with, the, with the Chiefs yeah, and all that stuff. So. Yeah. Um, I had Andy Reid. He was the quarterback coach uh, when I was in Green Bay. Green Bay. Yeah, yeah, oh I my gosh. That, up that was so cool. He, he was a great, you know, I, I didn't know him very well. You know, I was only mm -hmm. there for a year and I was on the defense of uh, Fritz, yeah. Fritz Shermer was our guy. But um, um, 
the, so kids nowadays. So I was sitting with Chris Nowinski. He's the one. Uh, he's the one that started pushing for the CTE clinical trials with Boston University. He he was a he was a he is a defensive lineman at Harvard, and then he got into. And what do you do as uh, you graduate defensive lineman from Harvard? What do what do you do uh, naturally? You get into professional wrestling. <laughs> He started yeah, sounds like a fit. He started cranking his head on the canvas huh. and he started getting the headaches and the, the, the concussions and more and more and more. And he's been instrumental and um, he was instrumental in getting the Ivy League to uh, take away pads during the season, during during um, the week and just go to pads uh, during yep. during the you know Saturday games. I don't I don't know how strict they have to be on it, but. Um, hmm. I really knowing what I know and knowing what I know about CTE and knowing what I know about inflammation, I told people, I, I don't get into the argument. You, you, you're crazy. If really your kid play football, I say, make sure they're taking omega threes. Hmm. Okay. That's what I say. Okay. If I see a mom that's, uh, you know, living vicariously or a father's living vicariously through their nine or 10 year old, I say, yeah, flag football is good enough until high school, but make sure they're taking their omega threes, please. Hmm. Hudson, get on your omega threes. Yeah. I've got a 15 year old freshman, but he, he played football this last season, but he's not sure he wants to play again, oh, okay. which is kind of like that. That's where I'm kind of like, do I say, okay. Or do I push? Cause you know, I want to do the Friday night lights thing. Like yeah, I want to yeah, yeah. go to the game <laughs> and play on the field, but you know, that that's ultimately his decision. He wants to focus on wrestling. Yeah. Think, yeah. I would, know. On what? Wrestling. If he, if he's uh, doing some, something competitive yeah. and he's yeah. not into really into football, don't, don't yeah. even think about it twice. Yeah. You go yeah. to the wrestling matches and you, and you start, when are the wrestling matches like Thursday nights? Start Thursday night under the lights. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's it's nonstop for wrestling season. That's it's wrestling season. Yeah. 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 Paul, we're up against it. I know you have another thing here in about two minutes, so I'm sorry to take you down to the wire, but I've really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I'm so blessed and thankful that my cousin Shari was able to connect us. I apologize that it's taken this long for it to finally happen, but thank you for your grace. But you know what? There's something to that too, because whatever you realized about yourself mm. and what he was talking yeah, about wouldn't yeah. have been so had we maybe not. made this connection maybe eight or nine months ago or whenever we were first trying. So yeah. there's something to there's some, sure. always something to the timing. Yeah. Dick Duran, uh, defensive coordinator, uh, later uh, head coach for the for the uh, Chicago Bears. Yeah, if you lost. Well, he if you lost or won, you'd come in as defense after the game and say. He would say what was supposed to happen out there happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so there's a reason. There's a reason. Shari was has been just wonderful get, get, getting us in touch, and she's yeah. she's a gem. She she is a smart cookie. She's no she's a she really. She, I, I wouldn't be anywhere without her and her digital guru ness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm so, so thankful. But there exactly, Jillian. There's a reason that this happened. You know. A month later or two sure. months later. So, and I really later, honestly, but I'm hoping that it's it's, <laughs> it's been okay. impactful it's for. To. I mean, grateful that it's been impactful for me, but I'm I'm hoping that it, it's impactful for the masses it, as well. And give this has been awesome. What a what a what a privilege and an honor. And really, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you for letting me share the story. Also, Louis yes. Aguirre, episode 21. Oh, yeah. Just to come, check that out. come full circle. So episode it's a 21. Long one. That one went about two and a half hours, maybe long. even three. But it was, it was a very long, long. but it was, it was so good. good. And and he really gets very um, vulnerable. Oh. And it's a great story. And I'd love for you guys to re reconnect. I'm sure he would love to hear from you as well. Now that you Absolutely. have something in common on being on the world-renowned Papa Ron <laughs> podcast. <Awesome. laughs> All right. And once again, before we let you go, don't forget, check out Gratitude and Empathy at DirtyDuckCoffee.com. Again, this is just as much about the mission as it is about the coffee. If you start your day with coffee, we'd love to get you started with the right mindset. That is to have gratitude for what you have in life versus what you don't have and having empathy for others. Um, and seeking opportunity to serve over others, even when it may not be convenient for you. It's a smooth Brazilian medium roast, and you can save if you use promo code PAPA, P-A-P-A, -A, on Gratitude and Empathy or any of the coffee blends over at DirtyDuckCoffee.com. So 
Paul Frey's Jillian Gregg. I'm Ronnie Phillips. Thanks for checking in. Episode 45 of the Papa Ron Podcast. Thank you all. You've been listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, hit subscribe now on the podcast platform. Follow the Papa Ron Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And while you're there, like, comment, and share. Until next time, thanks for listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. Papa Ron Podcast. Papa Ron Podcast.